physical geology class, let's talk about chapter 17, groundwater. Groundwater is water found in pore spaces, underground and sediment and narrow fractures. And groundwater makes up a significant portion of the freshwater reservoir on Earth. It's the largest freshwater re reservoir that's available to humans. Um, it only makes up about 14% of all fresh water, and that's because most fresh water occurs as glacial ice or in ice fields, which is inaccessible to most humans. And so groundwater makes up 94% of all liquid water freshwater reservoirs. So let's check that out. So this is total fresh water, okay? Um, this only is, uh, if total water on, water on Earth, it's only about, uh, I think, 3% uh, or 3.5% of total water. Might be 2.5. Double check me on that. Uh, but a small amount of total water on Earth is fresh water. But of that fresh water, most of it is ice sheets and glaciers locked up in areas that are inaccessible to us. Um, and so 30% of that is groundwater. And, and if we just consider liquid fresh water, 96% of that is groundwater. And that's really important in Florida. We have spectacular aquifers here. Um, they're geologically important too because water uh, or groundwater is an erosional agent. It can dissolve uh, limestone away, bedrock is limestone, form caves and sinkholes. Uh, so that's especially true here in Florida. Our bedrock is 10 to 15,000 feet of limestone. So uh, it actively will erode away that limestone and create uh, a unique landscape. It, it's also, groundwater is an equalizer of stream flow, meaning that if you have rivers, um, a lot of times groundwater discharges into rivers and helps sustain them uh, during drier periods. <clears throat> and every day in the United States, we use about 350 billion gallons of fresh water. 23% of that comes from groundwater. And it exists almost everywhere. So it's advantageous, especially in places that lack surface water resources. And uh, for the most part, it's used for irrigation. Okay, you can see that here um, of our sources of fresh water in the United States that are used. Okay, um, this portion here of groundwater, almost uh, the majority of it is used for irrigation for farms. Um, over here, then this is the public supply. So water, yeah, basic resource. Most groundwater makes it and becomes part of that reservoir f through precipitation. And so what happens is when it rains or snows, that falls on the ground and that slowly percolates uh, downwards until it hits the uh, uh, water table. Um, at the surface, uh, what we have is a zone of soil moisture. This is where water is held by molecular attraction in soil partic particles and regolith. And that's the water that's used by plants. That stuff generally evaporates right back into the atmosphere. Uh, water here, uh, water that's not held in the zone of soil, soil moisture will perco percolate down further uh, through the unsaturated zone or the Vado zone. All right. Here, the pore spaces sometimes include air and water. The Vado zone includes uh, the zone of soil moisture. And uh, just below that, right uh, above the zone of saturation, is this area called the capillary fringe. Um, and this is a region where groundwater is kind of pulled up uh, into the pore spaces by surface tension. It's kind of like if you've ever had a paper towel bounty or something, and you've uh, spilled water on a surface, and you just kind of lightly place the paper towel over the water, the water will climb up the paper towel uh, against the force of gravity. And so as you approach the zone of saturation, you'll run into uh, that uh, capillary fringe. All right, and then the zone of saturation, this is where the groundwater is, okay? It's also called the phreatic zone. Um, the top of this is called the water table. Okay, let's take an image. Let's look at a uh, cross-section of land area. Here's the zone of soil moisture, okay? So um, underneath that, this is the Vado zone. You can see here, 
there are water molecules in these pore spaces, but there's also a lot of air. And then this is the capillary fringe right above the water table, and the water table is right here. And essentially, I mean, you can go anywhere in Florida and just start digging. And if you dig, dig, and dig, and dig, you'll eventually get to the water table. In some places, it's much higher than other places. For example, I worked at an environmental consulting company in South Florida, and in Brickell, uh, the water table was only like a foot and a half. That's like two, <laughs> two shovelfuls, and then you're, and then you see the water. And when you dig a hole, what you'll see is the water like pool up. Uh, and start to uh, kind of coalesce and you'll see like water almost like as if it's a lake or something that's the water table in other places in south florida it was like 15 feet so it's just a little variable in terms of where the water table is all right and this is a cross section of a land area okay so here's the surface okay here's a river this here is the water table normal water table um, and then this is the water table during a drought. And so the water table or the location of the water table is variable depending on season. And that depends mainly on rain, really, because that's what recharges it. Um, where the water table intersects the land surface, you get discharge. So groundwater is contributing to this river here. And the water table mimics to a lesser degree the the surface landscape surface so um, the water table will kind of mimic what it looks like on the surface and then we build wells to access that water so the water table varies from year to year depending on precipitation um, and the the shape is like i said subdued replica of the surface topography let's take a look at some monitoring wells in the state of missouri all right, this is data collected from this well right here. And in Missouri, this well, the depth of the water table here uh, is about 61 feet. So you'd have to dig 61 feet down to get to the water table. And then what the data shows here, this is depth of the water table on the y-axis. On the x-axis is time. So this is uh, July, September, November, January, and March. And what we notice here is that there's a huge drop in the water table, and that coincides with a lot of dry weather. Okay, so it drops down to about almost 67 feet. So that's a drop of six feet. Okay, here are those wells, essentially. So here's the well, here's the water table in the well. Um, and that information is broadcast to a nerdy scientist in their office collecting that data. Um, and so in November, there were a few rain events. In January, there were a few rain events. And uh, after uh, there's precipitation, you can see the, the jump in, in the water table. And that just shows that uh, that's what's recharging the local water here, are those uh, precipitation events. You can also actually uh, map the contours of the water table, right? It's a surface underground. Here in Florida, um, you can kind of imagine it, like think of Valencia campus, Osceola campus, and think of uh, the, the retention ponds that are there. If you, if you look at, and this is largely true for many places in Florida, if you look at the surface of a retention pond or a lake, Imagine that surface kind of uh, intersecting and continuing underground. That's the approximate location of the water table here in Florida. And you can um, contour it like you would contour a landscape. Okay, um, And you do that by collecting uh, data from wells, uh, the depth to the water table. So here are locations of different wells and the elevations of the water table above sea level. So in this case, they're not telling you depth to the water, they're telling you um, elevation above sea level. So here are higher elevations. So the water table here is 151 feet above sea level. So this is higher. And then in, and over here, the water table is lower. And groundwater moves. It moves uh, on an average of four centimeters a day, pretty slow. But it moves from higher places to lower places under the influence of gravity, just like running water. And so if you were to draw contours of the surface of the groundwater, you would do it in this fashion. There's 140 foot, 130 foot. And the way you can determine, and this will be useful for your lab, uh, determine the, the direction of groundwater flow is drawing sh uh, lines, uh, straight lines at 90 degree to the contour line right here. So that would tell you the direction of groundwater flow. Okay. Then over here, if you draw a straight line, that is 90 degrees to the contour line. That tells you the direction. So the overall direction of groundwater flow here is in this direction. So you can predict the direction groundwater will flow uh, with you know different properties. Say there's a landfill here, and then there's like a, 
uh, a school over here, then we can, you know, that, that's a poor design. So a lot of the maybe contamination will pass in this direction towards the school or something, especially if that school has a well. So this is how we track how groundwater moves, is by contouring it, creating these groundwater elevation maps. And I actually did that uh, when I worked for an environmental consulting company in different areas. Because you can track the direction contaminants will move in the groundwater if there are any. So the water table interacts with rivers. Um, gaining streams are where uh, uh, are streams that um, gain water from the inflow of groundwater. So uh, groundwater discharges into the river. Losing streams are where rivers themselves lose water to the groundwater system. And then there are combination streams. Sometimes this can be dependent on uh, weather. Okay, so here are the examples. This is a gaining stream. So groundwater actively discharges into this river. Uh, a losing stream is where river water, the water table, see here, is below the river. Uh, so the river actually loses water to the groundwater system. And then this is a disconnected losing stream. So here, this must be a, a very dry area. This water is just percolating downwards to a very low water table. All right, let's talk about the factors that influence the movement and storage of groundwater. The first one is porosity. That's the percentage of open pore spaces in rock uh, that is available for water to fill. Okay, so depending on the size and the shape of the grains, that's how well um, those grains are sorted and how tightly they're packed. Uh, their porosity will vary. So poorly sorted sediments typically have low porosity. Um, imagine porosity this way. Get one of those orange Home Depot buckets and fill it with golf balls. That would be a very well sorted if those golf balls are all the same size. Think of sand all being the same size. Fill that orange Home Depot bucket to the top. You can't fill anything else in it, right? It's a full bucket, but you could fit water in it, right? So you could dump water into that until all the pore spaces in between the golf balls are filled. All right, so that's porosity. That's the volume of space that water can kind of fill in. And so porosity really determines how much groundwater can be stored. And you can measure that. If you've got a beaker full of sand, um, here we have some water, and then uh, you start pouring the water into uh, this beaker until it's completely saturated. Then you measure how much water you poured into it. In this case, the sediment-filled beaker now contains uh, half a liter of water, or 500 milliliters. Um, that means the porosity represents 50% of the volume of the sediment. So that's one way of uh, measuring it. Then the next factor that influences the movement of groundwater in particular are, is permeability. Permeability is the, abil is the ability of the material to kind of move through uh, the pore spaces in a rock. And that really depends on how well connected those pore spaces are. Okay. Um, and if you have good permeability, meaning that the water is able to move quickly, fairly quickly through uh, the bedrock, and you have a lot of porosity, that is a good reservoir for stored groundwater. We refer to that as an aquifer. So that's a permeable rock um, that transmit, transmits groundwater freely. In South Florida, that's the Biscayne Aquifer. In Central Florida, that's the Floridan Aquifer. If you have a unit underground that is impermeable and prevents water movement, such as clay or shale, those rocks don't allow water to kind of move through them. Those are referred to as aquitards. All right, so here's an example. Here's your uh, kind of cross-sectional view of similarly sized sediment, well sorted. That means you have great porosity. So a lot of water can be stored uh, in sedimentary rocks that are made up of sediment that are all very similarly sized. They'll have a lot of space in between them, which means a lot of rock, I mean, a lot of water can fill through them. If you have something that's po poorly sorted, generally um, that means you have very little porosity. So you have a lot of small grains and a lot of larger grains here. And what that means, those smaller grains in these, in these areas are taking up volume where water would have been. So here you have lower porosity. Then here's your demonstration of uh, something that's impermeable. So this would be like clay. There's no pore spaces whatsoever. Water can't move through this. Here's a, an example of uh, a porous material, lots of pore space, can hold a lot of water, but those pore spaces aren't very well connected, so permeability is low. 
And over here, this example, this uh, rock here is uh, permeable because the pore spaces are connected so water can kind of move freely through here. And it has a lot of pore spaces, so this would be a fantastic aquifer. Store a lot of water and the water is mobile. So groundwater moves really slowly, four centimeters per day. So that don't think of groundwater as like an underground river. That's a misconception. All right, a simple uh, uh, model to show you how groundwater moves um, <clears throat> is shown in this uh, next area here. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> but essentially, they uh, they it, it flows under the influence of gravity. Okay, and uh, it goes from higher areas to lower areas, just just how uh, water would move down uh, as runoff into rivers. Um, and there are areas on Earth that are called recharge areas, meaning that if it rains in that area, the water will percolate and become part of the groundwater reservoir. And in other areas are called discharge areas, and that's where the water table intersects the land surface and water comes pouring out. Um, there are two different types of aquifers. There are unconfined aquifers. The Biscayne Aquifer in South Florida is an unconfined aquifer. And there's uh, good and bad things about uh, uh, unconfined aquifers. One, um, what you see here, here's the land surface. And the land surface is uh, permeable, meaning that if it ever rains, um, the water will infiltrate and become part of the surficial aquifer which is a good thing because that means that this aquifer can recharge fairly quickly. It also can be very large depending on the size of the uh, permeable rock under the surface. Um, and if you build a well into it, uh, the, the water table will rise up to that same level in the well. And so that's great. This can recharge rapidly um, and that's great for, uh, for example, like the Biscayne aquifer, it's not pressurized. Um, the only problem is is if you have an accident, an oil spill, um, garbage dump, chemical spill onto the ground, that can easily contaminate an unconfined aquifer. So that's the drawback, is that you, it can be easily contaminated from the land surface. Just imagine a truck or a uh, you know, storage facility, um, and they have some sp spillage. Uh, that can go right into the unconfined aquifer. So that's the, the small drawback there. Uh, the other type of aquifer um, are confined aquifers. Confined aquifers have an aquitard above and below the aquifer. Okay, in central Florida, the Floridan aquifer is a semi-confined aquifer. Um, th what this, so what this typically means is that on the land surface, when it rains here, that will not, uh, that water will not infil infiltrate and uh, recharge the confined aquifer because there's a impermeable layer above it. So the drawback there is that these aquifers won't recharge as quickly, but the benefit is that is if there's any spilling or contamination on the land surface, that will not contaminate the con confined aquifer. A lot of times confined aquifers, the, well, the water itself can be under pressure, right? Sometimes the recharge areas are at higher elevations. So here's the recharge area, it rains, and then the, the, the water table level kind of also goes up. And so that provides a lot of pressure because of gravitational forces. And so the water in a confined aquifer can rise up to what we call the potentiometric surface. And the potentiometric surface is the surface of the groundwater at those higher elevations. And so uh, in some cases, the water can rise up so high up that it just flows out of the well. So you don't even have to pump water out of the well. That would be referred to as an artesian system. Okay, so a lot of times the water's under pressure and it'll rise above the water table here. So that's those are confined aquifers. Okay, here's that slide on groundwater movement. I don't know why it's a little out of order here. But here, just imagine this landscape. We have, uh, it's raining. These are recharge areas, so groundwater will flow down this way. This is at a higher elevation. So groundwater will move from the higher elevation to lower elevations, like this. Under the influence of gravity, four centimeters per day. Um, and then these would be the discharge areas. So this is a kind of a surficial model on, on uh, the direction of groundwater flow. Um, the way we measure groundwater movement is through this uh, mathematical equation that was created by uh, uh, Darcy. Uh, it's called Darcy's Law. 
and that measures the volume of water that flows through an aquifer. And it uses a number of variables. One is the hydraulic gradient, okay? So that is um, kind of like uh, how steep the ground or the water table is. Um, the conductivity, that is a measure of how freely the water can move through rock. Um, and the cross-sectional area. So the hydraulic uh, gradient is the water table slope, and the hydraulic conductivity takes into account permeability, okay, and the viscosity of the liquid, which water's uh, pretty much the same, but how it flows through different mediums uh, can change depending on whatever rock unit it's flowing through. So here's the, how you calculate the hydraulic gradient. If you have a well here, you can measure the distance to the water table here, and then down uh, hill, you have another well, and then you measure that height difference, H1 minus H2, divided by the distance between those wells, and that gives you the gradient. Okay, the higher the gradient, the more likely uh, faster the groundwater is going to move. But that also depends on the permeability of, of the water itself through what, whatever um, rock it's moving through. So a well is essentially like a straw put into the ground, bored all the way down past the zone of saturation below the water table so that we can access uh, the water. Okay. Modern wells are essentially just PVC pipes. So you get drillers, they drill uh, um, uh, a core into the ground and then they install two or four inch diameter PVC that has slits at the bottom of it. And that's how you can pump out uh, after it's, it's installed, you just run some tubing and then you can pump water out. Um, it's very common. There are more than 16 million water wells in the US. More than 13 million belong to private households. Okay, and so maybe some of you that are listening right now may have uh, uh, your own private well uh, in your house, especially if you're living beyond city limits. Um, it's, there's good and bad with that, right? Some, a lot of people in Florida will complain uh, that their groundwater is kind of sulfury, have a sulfur smell, or they call it like swampy kind of type water, um, which is a drawback. Also, you can have a lot of hard water uh, if you're pumping out your own groundwater. So some people um, have water softeners. Um, but uh, the good thing is that you don't have to pay any utilities for water. You don't get any bills from Toho or anything like that. Um, so that's great. You could be running your sprinklers all day. just. But there's a problem in that, uh, in that you could um, draw down the water table if you're pumping out too much. Okay, uh, What happens is that lowers the surrounding water table and creates uh, your favorite flavor of ice cream, cone of depression, okay? Uh, that forms around the well. And the hydraulic gradient will actually change as a result of the cone of depression. So imagine here we have a situation where we have two neighbors, there's a farm, here's a well. They have their own kind of mini cone of depression for whatever they're using the water for. But here they just built a new high capacity well because they're growing a crop that needs a lot of water. And so they'll create a really large cone of depression. You see that? It's almost like uh, you have a straw in your uh, drink from your fast food restaurant, and you just slurp it all out, and then the you know the liquid just kind of disappears, and all you're left with is ice. Yeah, that's what's happening underground. And so the water table can drop uh, significantly to the point where um, you'll uh, make your neighbor's well run dry. Artesian systems are wells where groundwater is under pressure and rises above the aquifer, and there's two types. Um, water, uh, well, in order to be an artesian system, water must, it must be a confined aquifer and also inclined, meaning that the recharge area is at a higher elevation. Okay. Um, there are two types. There's a non-flowing and a flowing artesian well. Um, and Artesian systems sometimes uh, occur naturally. We, we call them springs. So water just discharges from the ground to create a spring. A lot of springs here in Florida are like that. There are a lot of rivers here in Florida are spring-fed rivers. Um, and if this happens in the desert, uh, that's where desert oases show up. So here's your example. Here's a recharge area at a, at a higher elevation. Okay, here's the pressure surface, okay? This here is an aquitard above and below the permeable unit. So that makes it a confined aquifer. 
But here's the pressure surface. This is the surface where the water recharges. So here uh, the water is applying kind of gravitational uh, force, right? It's at a higher elevation. So this water wants to move down through the force of gravity. So that applies pressure to the water that's here. So if you build a well all the way down here, boom, access that groundwater, it'll flow up to the pressure surface up here. All right, and this will create a flowing artesian well. You don't have to pump it out, it just keeps flowing. What you have to do is cap it so you prevent flooding, really. Um, and then over here on, so on site one where this well is, if you look closely, here's the well, uh, the water will rise to the pressure surface here. So this is a non-flowing artesian system. All right, here's another example. An experience you might have if you ever go to a state school, not very pleasant. Someone pours some water into a funnel. Typically you're on the first floor, the basement or something, and then that water comes shooting down really rapidly. And that's because it's under the force of gravity. So you're creating kind of an artesian system. Um, we do this on purpose. Okay, we build municipal water towers to create artesian systems. So the tower acts as kind of like the recharge area and the pipes are the quote unquote aquifer. And then the faucets that we, uh, you know, when you open up your faucet, water comes shooting out and that's because the water is pressurized. And we do this on purpose, okay? Um, there are also uh, um, natural artesian systems in South Dakota across the Missouri River. Here's a cross section of it. We have a recharge area uh, at a higher elevation on the west side, so over here. Okay, um, and this recharge area, if it rains, the water goes into the um, Dakota sandstone, which is permeable. And then above this, the Cretaceous shale confining layer above it doesn't allow, um, or it's a, a permeable unit above it, and there's an impermeable unit below it. So two impermeable units. So if you build a well here, you'll create flowing artesian wells on this side of the Missouri River. Okay, so that's a, a, a classic artesian natural system. Here is uh, what we engineer. So we, this is why we store water tanks at really high elevations uh, above ground. So that provides the pressure that we need to take showers and wash our hands and stuff like that. So that's how pressurized water moves through uh, a small town or municipality. All right, then there are springs. You guys should be uh, familiar with these. These are natural outflows of water. Where the water table comes in in contact with the ground surface and water just discharges out. Um, let's take a look. This I'm sure you're familiar with this. This is um, Ginny Springs. So the water discharges from this limestone and kind of comes upwards. If you notice, if you've been to Springs, the water is very cold, so it's nice to be there um, in the summertime because the water is discharging from underground where it's much cooler. So it makes it very refreshing. We have hundreds of springs in Florida, and that's a great way to uh, kind of experience Florida and go on road trips is to go visit all the different springs. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Wakiva Springs. This is Rainbow Springs. Again, water's discharging from the ground, coming out. Uh, and this is the beginnings of a river, which is pretty cool. So the river just starts here. Um, I lived in Tallahassee for a while. There's Wakulla Springs is, pretty, is popular up there. And it's, uh, it's beautiful. These are very beautiful areas um, and what makes kind of Florida unique. Um, but <clears throat> the use of groundwater um, can cause a lot of environmental issues. Um, we should be really thinking about uh, the use of ground, because really there are no rules. Like if you own property away from city limits, you don't get city water, you can build your own well and you can do whatever you want with that water. You can pump as much water as you want out. And so there are no laws governing how much water you can use, okay? Um, so in a lot of places, not so much in Florida because we get so much rain uh, every summer, um, and so the groundwater system recharges fairly quickly. But in other places, um, like the High Plains Aquifer, which underlies most of the Midwest, a lot of the farming that occurs out there, um, it should be groundwater should be treated as a as a non-renewable resource because sometimes the the recharge rates there are much slower. The High Plains Aquifer, for example, 
is under about 111 million acres in the Midwest and accounts for 30% of all the groundwater used for irrigation in the predominantly agricultural areas in the Midwest. So here's, um, this is all the High Plains Aquifer. Now it's, it's complex, meaning that some areas are experiencing actually groundwater um, uh, replenishment and the groundwater tables are rising here in Nebraska. But other places um, are experiencing severe water table falls in, what, in Oklahoma, West Texas. What red means is more than 150 feet of falling groundwater table. Okay, that is severe drawdown. And that comes with problems. What that does is it causes subsidence. All right, the ground will sink if you pump too much water out. Essentially, like water fills up the pore spaces. It's almost like support for the ground surface. And if you pump all the water out, those pore spaces are replaced with air and that can be compactable. So the ground sinks as a result. Some crazy examples of this include the San Joaquin Valley in California, where subsidence has approached nine meters. That's 30 feet, guys, 30 feet in the past, I think, 50 years. Um, yeah, that's three basketball hoops stacked on top of each other. All right. In other places, this is occurring, too, in Las Vegas. That's a desert. They need water. It's very dry there, so they're using groundwater. New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Houston, and Galveston are all places where they're seeing subsidence. Mexico City ha is built on a lake bed. Um, that has as much subsidence in some areas as seven meters. So that's over like 23 feet. Um, and so S Mexico City is an old city. So some of the buildings that they built a long time ago, the entrance is now the second floor and the first floor is de facto basement. Here's the San Joaquin Valley in California. Okay, this is where we grow a lot of almonds and alfalfa and peppers and vegetables, stuff like that. But look, in 1925, this was the ground surface it has subsided around 50 feet, okay, over 52, I'm sorry, 30 feet over 52 years. Okay, that is incredible. It can also cause damage like this, huge, um, almost like canyons forming as a result of subsidence. A problem that's uh, more prevalent in Florida is saltwater intrusion. So when you pump out too much groundwater, uh, what what that does, uh, especially if you live close to the coastline or close to an ocean, is that salty groundwater can come in and replace and drown into those wells and contaminate the fresh water supply. And once your well has salt water in it, it's no longer usable. Fresh water is less dense than salt water, so it typically sits above the salt water. And so uh, when you pump out the fresh water faster than it recharges, then salt water kind of moves in. So here's that example. This is what's typically happening uh, in coastal Florida. Here's the, the boundary between fresh water and salty groundwater. Fresh water is kind of like a lens that sits on top of the salty groundwater. And here's a pump well. And if you over pump it, you'll pull in and have the salt water intrude. And that's a big problem. In South Florida, if you live anywhere uh, east of 95 and you build a well, you're pumping out salt water. All the well fields in South Florida are way out west in the Everglades or close to the Everglades. I like plantation, way out there. Um, in the Northeast, uh, in order to prevent ice from forming on the roads, a lot of times they'll throw salt um, on the roads to, to lower the uh, freezing temperature or, I'm sorry, raise the freezing temperature of, of the water. And that, that salt will um, uh, be picked up by that water and, and, and fall into these recharge basins. And then that uh, can kind of contaminate the water table with all that salt. So that's a, a problem. There's salt water contamination in those areas. And there's other types of groundwater contamination. One of the most common uh, contaminants is sewage. Um, a lot of people who live away from uh, cities will have septic tanks and septic tanks can le leak and still even if you live within a city you can have ruptures in in piping and sewage can come pouring out um, so in, in in very permeable aquifers that have a lot of porosity and a lot of uh, permeable or good permeability 
groundwater can travel long distances. And as it travels long distances, that means uh, if there's a spill, someone very far away who's using that groundwater could pull, essentially pull up contaminated groundwater. And sewage is kind of like a, it's a contaminant that has like a shelf life. Over time, microbes will break it down and actually um, purify the water. Now, over time, okay, so if you have an aquifer uh, that has slow moving water, um, that'll give you time for um, the water to clean itself up. So here's an, an example here. Someone uh, has a septic tank that leaks uh, in a very cavernous and limestone filled aquifer, <coughs> kind of like Florida. Um, and yeah, the groundwater flows in this direction and their septic tank is just leaking gross water, sewage water, right? And then this person over here um, is deriving their well from it and they're brushing their teeth in this contaminated water because it only takes days or weeks for that contaminated water to move through it. Um, in, a, in another situation where uh, you have months or years, very slow moving groundwater, that contaminated water from the septic tank uh, could take years before it gets over to well number two, which means this guy's okay to brush his teeth. Okay, because in that time span, the microbes would uh, kind of clean up uh, or purify that water, remove all the dangerous organic matter. Um, <clears throat> the Kona Depression, if you create one, it can reverse the slope of the water table and change the direction of water uh, of groundwater movement. So if you have contamination, uh, let's say like your house is here. Okay, actually, let's see if I have an image. Well, before we go there, um, other types of contaminants, uh, highway salts, we talked about that already, fertilizers from farmland, pesticides from farmlands as well, chemicals, uh, big polluters in Florida uh, with chemicals are actually dry cleaners. A lot of times we monitor uh, dry cleaners because a lot, oh, you know, how do, they, how do they clean your suits without using water, right? Fingernails? No, they're using chemicals. So. A lot of those places uh, will dump their chemicals uh, outside their stores, which is illegal, but they'll do it anyways because it's cheaper. Um, and so we have to monitor uh, the areas surrounding uh, dry cleaners to make sure they're not spilling chemicals into the groundwater. And industrial materials materials can spill in. And gas is, is one of those. Every gas station in Florida has like 15 wells surrounding the property to make sure those tanks, fiberglass tanks underground, uh, aren't leaking any gas into the groundwater system. Okay. So here's that. Uh, here's an, another example. So this this homeowner thought they were pretty slick, right? Yeah. They have a leaking septic tank, and they're like, "Well, nah, let's not fix it." Maybe they didn't know it was leaking. Whatever. Um, they ate a lot of chipotle. That chipotle water is going into the ground, right? Uh, but if they over pump. It doesn't even have to be them. Maybe it's their neighbor use a high capacity well and start pumping out the water. They create that uh, cone of depression. The, the groundwater flows in this direction, right? But because of that heavy pumping, that alters the, the, the shape of the water table and alters the movement of groundwater. And now um, this person played themselves and is now you know drinking up their own Chipotle water. Gross. All right, here's the landfill. Landfill juice can go into groundwater. Okay, that's a technical term. <laughs> um, and then this, these are uh, septic tanks, or they can also p potentially be like the fiberglass tanks that hold gas at gas stations. Um, those often leak, um, and and so gas stations are areas where uh, surrounding areas where the um, are uh, there's a high potential for uh, groundwater contamination. Um, the other crazy thing that groundwater does is that it, it's it's often uh, mildly acidic and it contains carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is uh, in the groundwater because when it precipitates, there's carbon dioxide in the air that combines with uh, the water to create carbonic acid. And carbonic acid will slowly dissolve uh, rocks that have calcite in them. Uh, and so uh, a rock that has a lot of calcite in it is limestone. And so limestone is very susceptible to this type of dissolution. Okay. Um, and that's what creates caverns. Caverns are the spectacular results of erosion and uh, water percolating through the Vedo zone 
um, and slowly kind of dissolving the water away as water tables rise and fall. Okay, there are over 17,000 caves that have been discovered in the United States. We have some in Gainesville. Uh, we have some in, in, in Tallahassee. A lot of the ones in Tallahassee need scuba gear because they're like below the water table. But anywhere where there's limestone as the bedrock, you'll find caves. And, uh, and that's particularly true in Kentucky. Kentucky uh, Mammoth Cave, um, this is a national park, and they have over 12 miles of caves that are open to the public. So you can go there and you know explore around for 12 miles. It's pretty crazy. So it's a big national park. Um, it's, oh, there's over 200 miles at Mammoth Cave, so it's the longest uh, cave in the United States. Carlsbad Caverns is in New Mexico, and Carlsbad Caverns is unique because um, it's <laughs> it's not as long as Mammoth Cave, but it's big, like cathedral-like. Like you can take an elevator; it goes takes you down about 1,500 feet to um, the main area, main cathedral, kind of large area, which can fit four football fields inside of it and has uh, ceiling heights of over 200 feet. <laughs> There's a cafeteria down there, so you can have your lunch. You can have a burger 1,500 feet uh, under, under, uh, under the ground at that national park in New Mexico. So here's the entrance to Mammoth Cave. Okay, and it's nice. It's nice, cool. Average temperatures are like in the... Uh, lower 50s to 60s inside of a cave. Great weather. Okay, so how do caves uh, uh, develop over time? Well, essentially, they'll develop in uh, numerous levels. And the most active area of erosion is just below the zone of saturation. Um, above that area in the Vado zone, dripstones form. Um, speleothems are the name given to these features. All right, and that includes stalactites. Stalactites hang from the ceiling. So let's say this is a ceiling. This would be a stalactite. And if this is the ground, this would be a stalagmite. And if they meet together, we would call that a column. Let me just show you here because my drawings are horrendous. Okay, so here's an example. Here's um, a cave just at the water table here. And water, water tables can rise and fall with geologic time, even you know shorter time scales than that. Uh, and that'll create um, kind of like the Swiss cheese cavernous uh, type of landscape underground in this limestone. Okay, you can have sinkholes form at the surface. That's how they form. And we call these landscapes uh, that are kind of shaped by the dissolving power of, of groundwater, um, we call that karst topography. And they're in regions that are underlain by limestone. So some of the common features that you see there are uh, irregular terrain and sinkholes. Sinkholes are areas where the groundwater has slowly dissolved the bedrock and then it's accompanied by a dramatic collapse. It can be dramatic, it can be kind of slow. Um, we also find tower cars. And these are huge uh, mountains uh, of limestone that are left behind, very sharp and jagged. Uh, and essentially they leave these residual towers. I'll show you pictures. So here's the development of a karst landscape. Uh, Florida, you know, we're, uh, our bedrock is limestone. So uh, if sea levels were falling, this is what would happen. Um, but that's not the case. Uh, so we're kind of stuck here. But over time, this is essentially what uh, Kentucky is like uh, right around Mammoth Caves. Okay, so you have sinkholes forming, springs discharging from uh, 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 canyon walls. Okay, here's a, a river. There's sinking streams that disappear down into the really low groundwater, and then there are caves all over the place here. Here's a solution valley. And so this is uh, quite common. Here are sinkholes, perfectly circular sinkholes in New Zealand. Look at this. Look how unlucky this homeowner was. Man, the sinkholes typically form like these perfect circles, and then you get a major collapse. And people have died. There's uh, people that have died in Florida as a result of sinkholes. Okay, um, that is a shame. That is uh, some bad luck here. Notice what the neighbors are doing. Yeah, that's a moving truck getting out of Dodge. Okay, so here's Lake City, Florida. Now their backyard has a pool. So this is uh, common in Florida. Here's, <laughs> look at this sinkhole. This is a sinkhole that formed in downtown Guatemala City, Guatemala. All right, there's over 5 million people that live in this, the capital city here. Nobody died, surprisingly, with this one. This one formed as a result of a, a pipe uh, leaking water and then creating this cavern. Uh, watch these two YouTube videos. Those are uh, 
uh, hopefully the links still work. We can't do it in this format, but uh, if you watch them, one of them's in uh, Land of Lakes, Florida, I'm pretty sure, and it's just the showing you the gradual formation uh, of a sinkhole, and some and two homes were lost as a result of that. Okay. Oh, here's the picture of it. Oh, more YouTube videos. So there's plenty of sinkhole coverage here. These are the two homes. Why did this stay here? Let's erase that. Um, these are these are those two homes. This is like us. This is here in Central Florida. Yeah. And so if you ever look at um, uh, uh, Google Maps or satellite image of Florida, especially like an area like Land of Lakes. Uh, all those circular lakes you see in central Florida, those were sinkholes. Those were sinkholes that collapsed, and then they, the, essentially the, the water tables exposed there, and we call that a lake, essentially. So all those circular lakes that you see, it's just a bunch of sinkholes. Let's see if that picture. Oh, no, this, here is the uh, risk assessment map for uh, central Florida. Well, the whole state, really, every county, in terms of how likely a sinkhole is to occur. Uh, maybe you live in uh, Polk County. That's uh, a very highly sinkhole prone area. You can buy sinkhole insurance. That's available here in Florida. I, I imagine most of you either live in Osceola or Orange County. Those are highly sinkhole prone. This area here, just north of Tampa, Pasco and Hillsborough County, that's very sinkhole prone. And a lot of the sinkholes will form around well fields because what well fields do is they pump out a lot of water so they create that cone of depression and when you lower the water table that will cause um, the ground to subside a little bit and then you can have some sinkholes form okay oh, okay here's the satellite image look at this guys these are all former sinkholes you see whenever you see a circular lake sinkhole 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 Sinkhole, 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 sinkhole. You get it. You get it, right? Sinkhole. These are all sinkholes. They all formed from a collapse, and then they just created a depression and filled up with water. Uh, that's why we have these, you know, these circular lakes. Okay. And then here's your example of, uh, of tower cars. Uh, you see this in Southeast Asia. This whole landscape was uh, limestone, uh, and then the water kind of uh, slowly preferentially dissolved areas in between these tower cars and just dissolved uh, these areas faster and left behind these jagged kind of peaks. And we call those uh, tower cars. And there's some beautiful art as a result of this kind of unique landscape that was carved by groundwater.